Uh, our last speaker will be Rob Sewell, who is the editor of Socialist Appeal and in the 1980s was a national organiser of militant. Um, uh, before Rob, we'll take uh, John Dunn, who was a participant in the Great Miners' Strike in 1984-1985. John is a miner. And he's also a representative, and I believe speaking here today, uh, on behalf of uh, Justice for Mine Workers, the organisation set up following the miners' strike in the 80s. Um, but before Rob and John, I'd like to call upon Chris Herriot, who um, is al was also a mine worker, also participated in the Great Miners' Strike in 1985, I believe he was in Scotland at the time. Uh, and I call upon Chris to uh, say the words. Thank you. Well, Comrade Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, fellow comrades, the bitch is dead. I could leave it at that, but I'm not going to, because I've got a rebel in the moment. People talk about John F. Kennedy. Before my time, I was just away. Where were you when John F. Kennedy was shot? Well, people may not remember where they were when Thatcher died, but I'm sure they've got to remember where they were when they heard the news that Thatcher had died. Because I know exactly where I was, and it seared into my consciousness. I got up early on Monday morning to make my sandwiches, to make sure I had some lunch. But because I got up early in the morning, I forgot the bloody sandwiches, and went to work without them. So I had to come back at lunchtime to get my sannies. As a consequence, I put on the news. So I was oblivious for the entire moment that that bitch had gone. What a great uh, uh, feeling it was when I heard the news. I didn't know what to do. Unfortunately, I work in Leicester. I actually live in Newport in South Wales, I only get home at the weekends. My involvement up in Leicester tends to be at my workplace, so I don't tend to get involved outside of that. So where do I go to celebrate? The only thing I can do is to go back into my work, my place of work, and seek out my colleagues. Of course, it's a university, there's nobody there. Fair and spirit. The students aren't back to next week. What am I going to do with myself? And then I got a flood of texts from former uh, colleagues in the industry, good comrades and friends. We're having a party. Come up and celebrate the demise of Thatcher. It's in this event or that event. Come along. Then I got a text that made me ponder for a moment. We're launching Leicestershire against the bedroom tax tonight. Go out and celebrate Thatcher's demise, or go out and help to launch the fight back against the cuts and benefits that's been orchestrated by this Tory government. What was more fitting as a celebration of the demise of Thatcher than to help to launch the anti-bedroom tax campaign in Leicester? And that's exactly what I did. And I went along to the pub, which has got the name Dick the Shit, Richard the Thug, or Richard the Thug. Anyway, I went along to the pub, and the meeting was being held in the dark room. And I thought, how apt that the signs on the wall for a meeting against the bedroom tax said, us and them. Because I think that's exactly what this society is all about. They talk about Thatcher being transformational. What was her transformation? What was it that she achieved? Surely she was the most divisive Prime Minister, but probably Winston Churchill before World War II, that Britain has ever had. What she did was absolutely diabolical. There's some people, you know, some of my colleagues in Leicester, for example, nice people, well-meaning, very liberal-minded, learned gentlemen and women. You ask me, why are you so bitter? 
about Margaret Thatcher. I mean, she's not exactly Adolf Hitler or Joe Stalin. No, you're right. She didn't have the opportunity to murder millions. But she would have done had she needed to in pursuit of her agenda. She used the full force of the British state against the miners. Six billion pounds was used to try and break our strike. And what was that all about? We were told that the pits were uneconomic. Well, we argued at the time we've never seen an uneconomic battleship, but you build them and cruise missiles and trident missiles and all the rest. Arthur Scarbo brought in economists like Andrew Glenn, the Oxford economist, who calculated that actually, if they kept the coal mines open and handed out coal free to every old age pensioner in Britain, it would be cheaper to the exchequer than the loss of all the taxation and all the rest of it through all the job losses that would go as a result of closing the coal mines. Because when you close a coal mine, it's not just the pit. It's not just the 1,500 or the 2,000 jobs in the individual coal mine that goes. It's the steel. It's the timber. It's the machinery. It's all the supplies that go into a coal mine and all the industries that produce them that are also going to the wall. There are communities in Britain that have never recovered from Thatcher's onslaught. From her viciousness. And where are we now? in this country, that we've closed the coal mine industry to all intents and purposes. Have we got the brave new world of wind, wave and solar power? Have we got the green technologies that we were promised? What we've got is a reliance on foreign coal. 50% of energy production this winter was produced through foreign coal in Britain. The only thing that Thatcher and her cronies are interested in is profit. And in order to secure ever increasing profits for her class, she had to break the power of the trade unions. And if you're going to take on the trade unions, you had to take on the most powerful trade union in Britain, the National Union of Mine Workers. And that's what that struggle was all about. It was us and them. It was the ruling class trying to make sure that the working class were emasculated so that we could get to this position, this wonderful position that we are in now. It was Thatcher, remember, who orchestrated what they called the Big Bang, the deregulation of the financial industries. They created that huge bubble that burst in 2008 and brought the world economy to its knees. And yet, what happened? Thatcher, whose children running Britain today, spite the mantra, private good, public bad, what happened when the bubble burst to these champions of private enterprise, the banks? What did they do? They ran cap in hand to the government for support. I heard uh, that character from the BBC whose name escapes me. Uh, the reporter, the political editor, saying, Thatcher has made great sweeps forward for Britain. Nobody talks these days about nationalisation. Well, that's funny. Because there are a number of the banks were nationalised. And actually, just a few days before he made that statement, the Welsh Assembly nationalised Cardiff Airport. Capitalism cannot survive without leeching off the state. They talk about dependency culture in Britain. There is a dependency culture. But it's not the poor. It's not people in benefits. It's not the unemployed. It's the rich and the powerful. They're the ones with the dependency culture. You know, people talk about self-made millionaires. People like Alan Sugar, Richard Branson, and so on. There is no such thing as a self-made 
millionaire. If they were a self-made millionaire, they'd be making in all the products themselves. They don't do that. They exploit you and I. It's our labour that produces the wealth. They only take the profit. I remember, not so long ago, in the height of the financial boom, my bank phoning me up all the time, asking me, would I be interested in any of their products? But I might. They don't produce anything. The only thing they produce is profit. But they were talking about financial products, apparently. In other words, loans. They wanted me to go into deeper and deeper debt just so that they could make profit. And that's the problem with Britain. That's the problem with the government. That was the problem with Thatcher. People ask me, these nice liberal people that I work alongside uh, at the, the Montfort University, how can you be pleased at the death of a human being? Well, if it was a human being, I'd have some sympathy. But unfortunately, capitalism dehumanises. And not only does it dehumanise us as workers, it alienates us from the product of our labour, but it dehumanises the capitalists as well. The rich, the super rich, who see us as nothing more than pawns, as nothing more than a source of their wealth and privilege. We don't count. We are like cattle to these people. Well, I have the same contempt for Maggie Thatcher that she had for us. And that's why I'm prepared to dance on her grave. I also have memory. I was lucky. I used to think I was unlucky. I used to think, what a shame I was born at the wrong time. I wish I'd been born so that I could have participated in the general strike in 1926 and fought for my class. I wish I'd been born at the time of the Spanish Civil War so I could have gone and fought against Franco and all the rest of it. Actually, I never realised that I was going to be involved in huge events in the UK like the minor strike of 1984-85. And yes, it was a defeat. But I'll tell you something. The lessons that were learned by the class in that struggle have not been forgotten. It's given us a base upon which to build. Look what's happened with Thatcher's death. They thought, the ruling class, they could wave a flag and we'd all come out running. All hail Maggie. Put let bygones be bygones. She's died, we'll make her a saint. Instead of which, we've had demonstrations, street parties, even riots up and down the country. What kind of idiot has decided to have a state funeral for such a divisive figure? 700 soldiers, they tell me, are going to line the route. I wonder if it's going to be enough. Because I don't think they've realised what could happen with the counter demonstrations that's likely to take place. Counter demonstrations for a funeral. Because that is what this woman has inspired. Hatred. Because that's what she showed to us. And I'm lucky as well, because I was born in a place called Newton Grange. It's a mining village. It was a model mining village. It now is home to the Scottish National Mining Museum. That's what they call the Lady Victoria Colony these days. The Scottish National Mining Museum. And I'll tell you what makes me angry, what made me angry, what made me want to fight in 84, 85. And I lost my job in that strike. I was victimised, I was sacked. And I went through a year of hardship and I'd do it all again. We were right to make a stand. But what made me mad was one day, in the early 80s, before the strike 84-85, I was walking around our village and suddenly this awful sense of foreboding came over me. I didn't know where it was. I had this feeling that something terrible had happened, but I just couldn't put my finger on it. And then it dawned on me. In my 
village. Anywhere you went, and by the way, when I say village, it's really a small town, 20,000 people. But wherever you went in my village, you could hear a sound. And that sound came from the quarry. It was the bad air coming up the mine shaft. And it suddenly dawned on me what had happened. They tapped the pit. The village had stopped breathing. Literally. The village had stopped breathing. And it dawned on me at that moment what was going to happen to all the mining communities in Scotland, Wales, Yorkshire, the North East, and all the rest if the Tories got away with their closure program. That feeling of foreboding, that death in communities was going to be a reality up and down this land. And actually, because we lost this way, there are communities in South Wales, in Scotland, in the North East, that have never recovered from this strike. There are no industries. There are no jobs. There are young people with no hope, no aspiration, and no future. And they're blamed for this by the very Tory government that caused it in the first place. Thatcher's children are blaming the youth of today for Thatcher's legacy. That's the reality. But you see, Duke Grange, we've got this fabulous mining museum. It employs about four people. So, you know, it's what two pounds for four. Fair deal. You go to that museum and I urge you to go. And you'll learn about a guy called Mungo Mackay. Mungo Mackay was the manager of the Lothian Coal Company. And back before World War II, the Lothian Coal Company owned the village. They owned the houses. They owned the shops. They owned the pub. They even had their own Lothian Coal Company police. If you were drunk on a Saturday night, you were arrested and held in a cell by the Lothian Coal Company. You went up before a judge the next day. You were up before the colliery manager. Mungo Mackay decided what your fate was going to be. They controlled our lives. If you wanted your son to go to university, you had to ask Mungo Mackay's permission. Because if he needed labour in the mine, that's where your son was going, or you were getting evicted. Mungo Mackay would go around the village inspecting people's gardens. If they weren't tidy, you were given three days to tidy them up, or you were evicted. They controlled us, lock, stock, and barrel. That's what free enterprise is. That's what it leads to. It leads right up to monopoly and total control by the ruling class. See, when Mungo Mackay died, not only our village, but all the villages in Midlothian turned out for his funeral. Not to celebrate, just to make sure the bastard was dead. And it's going to be the same with Maggie Thatcher. She's going down in history in the same way as Mungo Mackay is going down. As a swine, as somebody who was completely uncaring, who went from their agenda without thought for any other human being. I just wish that our leaders and the Labour and Trade Union movement were as resolute in defence of our class as Thatcher was in defence of ours. But it's not enough for us to say, ding dong, the witch is dead. It's good. I'm glad to see it's top of the iTunes charts. And it's number six in total. And we'll leave it here that we can get it to number one eh, overall. But that isn't enough. What we've got to do is say, right, one down, let's get rid of the rest of these bastards once and for all. Let's get rid of capitalism and let's bring in a socialist system of society. Okay, thank you very much, Chris, for that. Uh, I'll call upon uh, John to speak next. 
Well, comrades, I first shared a platform with Chris 29 years ago during the miners' strike. He's not changed a bit. He's still Scottish and he's still nicking my speech. <laughs> so, I'm John Dunn, I might as well sit down after that. But the legacy of Thatcher came home to me today. I had to go for a, a physiotherapy appointment at my local health clinic. Part of the legacy of Thatcher and capitalism and working in the mines. And they got the local radio on. I don't normally listen to it. It's called Peak FM. It should be called Puke FM because it churns uh, Spandau Ballet crap and all that sort of stuff and tunes from 80s all day, intermingled with a little bit of local news, and I listen to it when I'm not going to watch the best football team in the world, Chesterfield, I listen to it for coverage, and that's all. But today it made me prick my ears up, because somebody had done a survey in Chesterfield, and they found that 50% of the people of Chesterfield who are in work are working considerably longer now than they did this time last year. 50% of the workforce are having to work longer and harder to make ends meet. That is a continuum from the defeat of the miners, not during the strike. We weren't defeated, we went back undefeated. We lost the aftermath, if you like. Well, that is a continuum from that day to now, the smashing of the trade union movement, the erosion of workers' rights, mean people work longer for less pay and suffer as a consequence. Chris is right, the ruling class misjudged things. I think this week they've actually been shaken, because as he rightly says, they thought we were all going to get our little rule Britannia flags there and it should be another Princess Diana. I weren't that bothered when she went either. One day and a few more royal parasites too were my attitude. Well they thought, they'd really fallen for their own propaganda about this gigantic towering figure. who we'd all mourn, we'd all line the streets dressed in black. They didn't calculate, especially in the north. Spontaneous parties, a real uprising of joy came to the set. I've never seen anything like it. Chris says he'll always remember where he was the day he heard the news. I was sat at my computer. I'm not very computer literate. I was actually trying to get the tipex off the screen from all spelling mistakes and making emails. I heard something on Sky News and I looked in and that little uh, news uh, flash thing at the bottom, Thatcher, dead. I jumped for joy. I kept flicking through news channels trying to find uh, more detail. Then the sad news came. She passed away peacefully. <laughs> I wanted her to die doubly incontinent. I wanted her to die wrapped in pain, and I wanted her to experience some of the suffering that they've imposed on my communities. Can't have everything, I suppose. Now, we don't normally get carried away. We don't normally say all the ills of society were caused by individuals. We know different to that, but this woman, more than anybody, encapsulated capitalism at its most rotten, greed at its most rotten, and the ruthless pursuit and use of power. So no wonder that working class communities rejoiced. I got so fed up of the news coverage, I decided I'd go and watch some paint dry, it'd be marginally, so I decided to decorate a bedroom. Well documented, it's on Socialist Appeal website, so it must be true. So I start painting a wall, and then the phone keeps going. I end up with a mobile phone covered with magnolia emulsion, because I've seen grand designs and all that, I know what you do to smart your house up. I end up with a wall 
that has dried so it looks like the damn touring shroud. So that she couldn't even die at a convenient moment for us. So I'm lucky if anybody wants to do something constructive and you aren't quite sure how to commemorate her funeral, come and paint that damn wall please for me. Because every time I walk in, I've got this memorial to Margaret Thatcher. I don't mind, but I'm hoping to sell the damn thing eventually. Anyway, Margaret Thatcher's legacy. Let me tell you about what happened. Chris has touched upon it. 1984, our strike. Like Chris, I was arrested. I made the most foolhardy mistake of my life. I turned me back on a copper with a truncheon who decided to try and teach me a lesson and cave the back of my head in. But I wasn't alone. That's right. Chris has talked about the £6 billion that they spent to try and defeat the NUM. £6 billion in 1984 money. What's that worth now? 20, 20 billion? Something like that? 180,000 members of the NUM in 1984. 180 pigs producing over 100 million tonnes of coal. Number of NUM members today is around 600. The last working coal mine in the Rotherham area, in the Rother Valley area of South Yorkshire closed last week, Maltby Colliery. All those people, all those communities, just thrown on a scrap heap, sacrificed on the altar of bare, naked capitalism. Look at the figures of what they did. 11,000 of my colleagues arrested in one strike. Can you imagine that? Rings of steel around whole villages. This woman who they say, well she, would, she won three elections. I actually been interviewed a few times by local uh, media. Did a couple of slots on, on local radio and said, well she must have been popular, she won three elections. So I pointed out that to win one election, the SDLP split away and split the Labour vote. Another election was won on the lives of people slaughtered in the Falklands in order to win a war to become popular. And on the other one, she was up against Neil Kinnock. <laughs> and as I said, my grandson could have knocked him over. <laughs> so, forget about all that. Let's go back to the strike. Number of miners like Chris Sack, 966. We still raise funds to get, it, to get their families some of them obviously have passed on, some found work elsewhere, but we still raise funds to give a little bit of a Christmas treat to families of people who have never worked for 31 years, remembering the year of the strike and, and that. We're still having to do that. Number of miners injured, including myself, over 7,000 injured, hospital. Two miners murdered. Dave Jones, a young lad of 24, killed on the picket line at Ollerton. Now he recently had a Tory minister who somebody said he'd accused the police of being plebs. Immediately there's been an inquiry. David Jones died 29 years ago fighting for his union and there's never been a proper inquiry into his death. Joe Green, an older picket, died crushed under a lorry at Ferrybridge Power Station. When police towed scab lorry drivers, drive straight through their only pickets. They drove straight through Joe Green and crushed him. Where were the press mourning these people at that time? We were the enemy within, we were hooligans, we were violent. And today, Chris has mentioned uh, the song from, uh, what's it from, is it the, uh, from the Wizard of Oz, right? That looks like, there's going to be, the, the BBC have got a dilemma. Should they play it? Because it might be disrespectful. 
The BBC had no problem reversing the footage at Orgreave to make it look like my comrades had attacked the police when they showed that film sequence in reverse order. What was actually a police riot and almost a, a massacre of our comrades, the BBC deliberately switched the order to make it look as if we had attacked the police. Took them ten years to apologise. No quandary about whether they did that, but they have a quandary about playing a record that people have bought. And again, that sums up this great leader that we're in mourning for. Street parties, people buying records, people buying t-shirts like this. Have you ever known that? For somebody supposedly a great statesman. And one of the questions that uh, the local radio asked me were about being disrespectful to the dead. Because she's got a family. And I said, well I noticed Mark's had to fly back. He weren't even at a bedside. So probably overseas causing some military coup somewhere. Or something like that. Disrespectful. Now, I go back to when my father died. And one of the things of sadness I have is that my dad didn't live to see this woman die. Wasn't a political animal, my dad, but he spent the 80s wrapped in pain waiting for a hip replacement. He spent the 80s watching his two sons attacked on picket lines, being driven back to work. He would have reveled in her death. But when my dad died, he left me some funeral wishes. No religion, for some reason he decided not to be buried with his stepmother, I don't know why, but he decided he wanted to cremate him. Wanted me to do his funeral oration, so I did all that because I respected his wishes. Now I think that Margaret Thatcher's family might be a little bit disrespectful. She's having a state funded funeral. This woman who didn't believe in state intervention, this woman who believed in privatising everything, her family are letting us all spend 10 million quid. I suggested to the local media that perhaps they should follow her wishes and put it out for tender to the lowest bidder. Because I could get a few mates together who pay for that privilege. <laughs> but they're not even burying her, I understand. They're going to burn her. And I ask myself, is that perhaps because a grave might become a focal point. That it might be a bit like Jimmy Savills, who incidentally was a good friend of hers, and that people might attack it and vandalise it, and things like that. And they're going to send her up in smoke to get rid of all trace of her, so we don't have a focal point to protest. Now, Chris has rightly said, we have to remember the real legacy of capitalism, we have to remember the real legacy of Margaret Thatcher. And he talked about walking through his own town. I was born in a mining town that never recovered from the 1960s when the local pits, Parkhouse, Morton and all those closed. But at the time of the strike, Claycross was still a mining town. Not a nice place to live in, a bit rough and ready, but it was a community. And like all mining communities now, it's what I call a 3D community. The three Ds, dole, drugs and desperation. That's all we've got. We've got some of the most deprived wards in Europe, not even in, in Britain, around Chesterfield, as a result of what that woman's government, on behalf of the capitalist class, did to my industry. I worked in a pit, Markham Colliery. If you're ever going up the M1, Junction 29A is situated right in the middle of what was Markham Colliery. When I worked there, there were three pits in that yard and a workshop that repaired machinery. Over 3,000 people worked there. All thrown out of work. In the late 90s, John Prescott had one of his brainwaves. He said, why don't we build 
a motorway junction and give you a business park. Hallelujah! A couple of years ago, the press did a survey on how many jobs had replaced those 3,000 plus mining jobs. 84! Right? We've not even got a call centre. We've got a few distribution centres, but a few lorries go in. A, a big chilled food place that about six people work at. 84 jobs replacing 3,000. That's the legacy of what Thatcher did to my industry. Now, I could go on at length about Thatcher, but just think of all the woes of society. <coughs> Who turned the banks into casinos so they could gamble our money away? Who privatised energy so people have shivered through this recent winter? So old age pensioners have to decide between food and heating. Who sold that off? Who privatised everything that she could? The woman getting the state funded funeral, Margaret Thatcher. But I do a lot of travelling up and down the motorway. And I don't know if you've ever been stuck in one of those quaint little things that them sides thought would say, cure head. Margaret Thatcher even lifted the weight restrictions on lorries, so the foreign lorries that had a 38 ton axle weight rather than a 30 ton could use our roads and clog them up. So even road congestion's down to that woman. <laughs> I'm blaming her for this cold that I've got today because I think I've been out celebrating too much. Anyway, Chris is right. The best thing we can do, as I say, if you're wondering what to do on Wednesday and you don't want to come and put that wall right for me, go out and party somewhere. I'm hoping to get up to my mining colleagues in Durham who are doing it proper. They're going down to Easington Miners Welfare. They've organised a hog roast. They've organised banners, bands and everything. They were going to hire a marquee. Well, they couldn't get one big enough. So that's where I'm hoping to be. But by all means, celebrate on Wednesday and celebrate your heart out. Not just because it's Margaret Thatcher, but because of everything that she encapsulated and represented. But remember, her legacy still lives on. Capitalism is still rampant. And as Chris said, unfortunately, we don't have a leadership that looks after our class like she looked after hers. I was almost puking at some of the tributes that I saw from so-called Labour MPs to her. Apart from Glenda Jackson, who was just, I didn't even know she was still an MP. But suddenly she's woke up and said something. Might be the fact that I think she's not standing at the next general election that gave her the courage. But what we've got to fight for is a leadership capable of leading our class like she fought for hers. What our ultimate goal after Wednesday, you can all have Wednesday off from the fight for socialism because we all need a bit of light relief from time to time. Party like you've never partied before. But after Wednesday, the fight goes on to change this rotten system that Margaret Thatcher represented. For me, it's a bit personal. I mentioned Davy Jones. I always feel personal about that. 24 years old, went out one night, never came back. Never saw his kids grow up. Never saw his grandchildren. I don't just want to change society. I want revenge for people like him. Everybody who was murdered on picket lines, everybody who was in prison, and I want proper revenge, and that's the bringing about of a socialist society. Thank you very much for that, John. Uh, well. well, uh, I don't know pigeon speeches, but uh, certainly a difficult act to follow, as they say. Um, I know John a number of years, and Chris, and uh, particularly during the miners' strike. The biggest battle that we had 
in Britain since the 1926 general strike. But I think uh, it is true to say that uh, we will never forget and we will never forgive on the basis of what has happened to our people, the working class people of this country. And of course, Thatcher epitomized capitalism in the raw. She expressed vividly the crisis of British capitalism and how it was going to be resolved at the expense of the working class. In fact, she said in 1979 that her task was to make Britain great again, to restore the power of British capitalism on a world scale. Of course, uh, Britain in 1979 had seen the end of a Labour government of Callaghan, Jim Callaghan, which incidentally was brought to power in 1974 after the miners' strike of that year, which brought down the Heath government Again, the first time in British history that the trade unions have brought down an elected government. And uh, clearly, the Conservative Party and the leaders of the Conservative Party wanted to wreak revenge for that particular humiliation, as well as restore, as they saw it, the position of British capitalism. They always say, well, you know, Thatcher was brought to power because the working class itself was in a state of, well, the winter of discontent in 1979, which apparently brought down the Labour government and prepared the way for Margaret Thatcher. And in fact, what the winter of discontent illustrated was the discontent itself with the Labour government had been brought to power. In 1974, that was the height of a struggle that took place over the previous three years. It was the biggest movement in Britain since the 1920s. Factory occupations, strikes, day in and day out. And the reason being that the working class was under attack, massive inflation, living standards were falling, and they had to fight in order to preserve what they had. And as a result, there was a mass movement on the industrial front, which then began to express itself on the political front, which brought to, go, to power the Labour government of Wilson and Callaghan. And they gave promises. They wanted to give out reforms. And they started on the basis of reforms. But unfortunately, the Labour government, as all Labour governments have done, instead of using their position to change society, they've always used it to reform capitalism. And once they began to reform capitalism, they were dictated to by the laws of capitalism. And as capitalism itself is run for profits and profitability, then the world policy was to try and prop up the profits of British capitalism to try and make it work. But in doing so, they had to attack the working class itself. Not because they were nasty people necessarily, because that was the laws of how capitalism worked. And we saw um, the hopes that were there in 1974. And that was we've got a Labour government, it's going to act in our interests, it's, it's, it's said it's going to introduce reforms, but as soon as it got into power, it then began to bow the knee to capitalism. It was a threat by the capitalists that that government should carry out the policy that it dictates and not with the policy that it was elected upon. And as a result, you had the IMF being called in, you had wage restraint being imposed on the working class, and workers had to fight the Labour government. The, the fire, firefighters in 1979. In 1978, you had the Ford workers going on strike. In other words, the people who put the Labour government in power were forced to fight the Labour government because of the counter measures it was now introducing. And that was the, the epitome of the winter of discontent. The low paid workers who were suffering the most had their backs against the wall and were trying to fight for justice against a Labour government, which, yes, resulted in what?
disillusionment, demoralisation amongst our people. After all, surely a Labour government elected by us would carry out our interests. And as a result, you had this, yes, winter of discontent, demoralisation. Thatcher then was able to come to power in 1979, promising to restore the position of British capitalism. And uh, we saw within the space of two to three years, unemployment rocketed from 1.5 million to over 3 million. She presided over the biggest destruction of manufactured industry that we've seen. 20% was destroyed. We always we said at the time that uh, Thatcher's did done more destruction than the Germans did in the Second World War. And that had a, a ring of truth about it. And there was an enormous offensive against the labour movement. But at that time, things were falling apart. The biggest recession, growth in unemployment, a lot of uh, discontent in the population. In fact, we saw it afterwards, we didn't know it at the time. Thatcher in 1981-82 was in so much difficulties at that time, they were threat she threatened to resign at that moment to show that she was on the rocks. But Labour was up in the opinion polls. Unfortunately, what cut across it, as we know, was the Falklands War in 1982, which then they were able to fly the flag of patriotism and so on, of kind of mobilise the backward workers, mobilise the middle classes to support the re-election of Margaret Thatcher. And when that re-election took place in 1983, then the gloves came off. Then there was an attempt then to, to really change the whole situation by introducing anti-trade union legislation to undermine picketing, undermine uh, the basis of uh, strike action and so on, in preparation for taking on the miners. And the reason why Thatcher took on the miners was because of, they represented the heavy battalions of the British working class. They, they were victorious in 72, victorious in 74. They carried out solidarity action when nurses went on strike. They were looked up to as this leading layer of the working class movement. And therefore, if you could undermine the miners, not only would be repaying the revenge of 1972 and 74, but then they could cow the rest of the working class itself. Defeat the miners, then they thought they'd defeat working people. And after Thatcher was re-elected, in 1983, after the victory in the Falklands, she believed that she could in, should repeat the victory of an industrial Falklands and smash the miners and prepared the way for that. You know, uh, they brought on uh, Ian McGregor, who came over from America, who first of all headed the British Steel Corporation, and they, within nine months they provoked a strike. And half the workforce of the steel industry was sacked as a result. And he was taken from steel and put as the national uh, chairman of the British Coal Board in order to prepare the same thing, but in the coal industry. And all the strategy of the ruling class at that time was to weigh up how they could defeat the miners, how they could make the police force a national police force, how they could manipulate social security benefits, and all the things are put into play in order to try and take them on. As, uh, as was said by John and others, that they even falsified the books, if you like, to, sh to ensure that, book, that pits were seen as uneconomic. And therefore, the scene was set for an onslaught, the biggest class battle you've had in Britain since 1926. And the only problem was, I think what have said here, that the miners weren't defeated. They thought, Thatcher thought they would defeat the miners in a matter of weeks. But on the contrary, it stiffened the miners, stiffened the mining areas. Why? Because they knew it was a question not of wages, but as defence of jobs and the community. If they went down, everything would go down. And therefore, we would say that these areas rose to the occasion. And particularly the miners' wives, I would say, 
Those who never played any role at all in trade unionism in the past, or politics or whatever, they rose to the occasion. And the miners' strike went on for 12 months. Unbelievable. And it showed, therefore, the, the tenacity that was there. The preparedness for fighting all the way if need be was there. But we know it wasn't the lack of resolve of the miners that, that led to the situation. But it was the, the lack of resolve of the leadership of the British Labour movement. And I agree with John on that, that there's lots to be learned from the Thatcher period. Because we know that we had also other struggles in the 1980s, which are a bit different. We had, for instance, the battle in Liverpool, led by the militant Labour Council, which was elected in 1983. And the policy was no cuts, no attacks on working people. The government has robbed us of hundreds of millions of pounds because they cut the money from the local authorities. We demand that back, and we will wage a campaign of civil disobedience in Liverpool, and we'll take it to the rest of the country to defeat the mining, to defeat the, the Thatcher government if need be. And uh, they got concessions on the basis of a militant struggle. Unfortunately, you compare that to today, where Labour councils, in a scandalous fashion, have been prepared to accept and carry out the cuts of the coalition government. Liverpool refused to do it and as a result was able to make um, not only built, not only by, this was not on the tops, the whole of Liverpool rallied to the, to the cause of the council itself. Why? Because they, they first of all built 5,000 council houses at a time when Thatcher was cutting back on council houses. They created 2,000 jobs through job creation and they also increased the facilities on health, on education and other social facilities in the city. In other words, workers saw them fighting back and uh, all Liverpool uh, did was to, well, we've shown what can be done, we call on all Labour councillors to do the same and other councillors were attempting to get Round their problems by increasing the rates. In other words, people should pay for their, their services, so increasing the money or burden upon them. And we said no, but they wanted to increase rates. But Thatcher then came back and said, hang on, we're going to rate cap all the local authorities. So that's put an end to that. And we said, okay, let's have a united front of all labour authorities against the rate capping, which happened in 1985. 30 Labour authorities, including Ken Livingston, Margaret Hodge, and all the others, Blunkett and Ken Cole, were all for it. Yes, yes, we're going to oppose the, the, the Thatcher government. And on the, on the 11th hour, they all capitulated and left Liverpool isolated and also of Lambeth itself. And as a result of that, they surcharged those councillors in Liverpool. They didn't the, every single council, the, the Brave 47, won all the elections that they, they, they had. In fact, the Labour vote was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And in fact, if you look at the vote in 1987, where Thatcher again won the election in 1987, the biggest swing to Labour throughout the whole of the country was in Liverpool. And it's because they stood up and fought for the working class. Militancy pays, they said. We will not give in to the pressure of the Thatcher government. And as a result, the, they stepped in, the government, the, the establishment, who are now praising Thatcher to, to heaven, or high heaven, they're the ones who stepped in and surcharged all those 47 councillors by a team of £7,500 each. They were fined, in other words, and debarred from office. They were taken out, not because of the electorate, in fact the electorate supported them, but because of the Thatcher government and, I would say, the failure of the Labour leaders. And I think we have to understand, it's not a one-way street here where Thatcher is the, is, is, the, is the main enemy. She was the main enemy, but she could have been defeated. She could have been easily defeated if the Labour leadership had been up to the task. Unfortunately, they weren't in interested in this. Neil Kinnock, 
God rest his soul, when he uh, dies, I tell you, he's the one who came forward and said, dented shield. We can't afford to take on the Tories in a, in a confrontation. We must have to cut the, carry out the cuts in the best way we can. Dented shield policy. The same thing they're doing at the present moment up and down the country, which means carrying out the cuts for the coalition government itself. And of course, as far as Liverpool is concerned, they attacked the Liverpool councillors and undermined their struggle because they didn't want to see militancy pay. These were the great moderates who then attempted to ditch all Labour Party policy on any left-wing programme. And, well, what they went and did was a, what they call a prone cocktail offensive in the city of London where they had, uh, you know, different uh, celebratory drinks and so on with big business to win them over to the Labour Party, this new Labour Party that was going to ditch the militants. Of course, you had the, the witch hunts and the expulsions of militant and others in the 1980s because of the stand that we were taking in order to make the Labour Party acceptable to capitalism. That was the whole idea. That they wanted to drive out not just militant, but the left itself. Because some of these lefts didn't need driving out. They just jumped ship and became right-wingers. And we saw that then with the emergence. Talk about Thatcher's heir. Well, Thatcher said that the heir was Tony Blair. He's the man, he's the man who's, 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 who's also the continuation of the Thatcher policy of making capitalism work, which means at the expense of the working class. It can't be done in any other way. And that's why we saw the continuation of privatisation. We saw the continuation of the anti-trade union laws. We saw the ditching of clause for the socialist aspiration of the Labour Party. And Blair wanted to break the links with the trade unions as well. In other words, he wanted the Labour Party, who say, he said, you wish it never been created in the first place. He said, Labour really should become more like the Tories. And that's what he uh, bent over and attempted to do. In other words, continue where Thatcher had started to, to emasculate the working class movement, if you like. And of course, in the trade unions, you also had new realism, class collaboration. Well, after the defeat in 1926, you had that philosophy, and that's what the same in the 1980s. And the trade union leaders like Norman Willis and so on epitomised this particular trend, class collaboration. We can't strike. The working class is too weak. The working class doesn't exist. We therefore have to bow down to the market. And that was the philosophy of the trade union leaders, the labour leaders. And that's why we're in the mess we are at the present time. The working class has suffered a counter-revolution. Let's be clear about it. Compared to what we were before, the job security is gone. Stress levels are through the roof. You know, two days ago they had a report about zero-hour contracts, which has been rapidly rising. In other words, you're going back to Victorian times. In fact, that's what Thatcher wanted. She praised Victorian values to make Britain great again. And of course, the way they did it was to smash British industry, because they weren't interested in investing, and rely on services, banking, financial services, property speculation, and all the rest of it. That's the reality you have at the moment. This is the mess we got at the moment. That's why British capitalism is very weak and feeble, as we saw by the crisis, the last crisis where it was affected more than any other major capitalist powers itself. Therefore, the whole struggle must be, as, as was explained, yes, to fight for a trade union movement that represents the interests of the working class, and let's give, this, you know, let's give due to the struggle of the miners of Scargill and so on. They were prepared to fight to the end, and others were prepared to uh, stab them in the back, like over whopping and the doctors and all the other sections, there's, there's a lot of crimes against the working class. But we learn the lessons of that. We need leaders in the movement who are not capitulate to capitalism, of class collaboration. We have leaders who are prepared to lead and to base themselves on the aspirations of the working class people for a better life. And that means to fight in that kind of way to the end, to the bitter end, not only in the trade unions, but also in the Labour Party. I think the United is correct. The Labour Party was built for the working class. It came out of our suffering 
our sacrifices that have been taken over by these creatures, the Kinnicks and the Blairs and all the other tripe that's up the top, who have now use it in their own career models, who are not interested in socialism because they have made their peace with capitalism. Responsible capitalism, says uh, Ed, uh, Ed, whatever his name is. Christ, no, it's responsible. What the hell does that mean? Capitalism is there for the exploitation of the working class. Responsible or not, that doesn't commit to it. And if you accept capitalism, you will accept the very logic of capitalism. That's what past Labour governments have done, and that's why they failed. And unfortunately, if Labour goes down this road again, they will also fail in those circumstances. But I think workers are fed up now. We're fed up to the teeth. And I think this backlash about that is an indication of the mood that's developing in society. People are pissed off. People are very gutsful. And, and this is just simply antagonise them more, in my opinion. And Paul hopefully will, and I will do it. There's talk now the TC organised a one day general strike. First time since 1972, they've actually talked about it. First time since 1926, they've actually done it. And that's the kind of mood change that exists in Britain and throughout Europe and the world for that matter. So the idea of socialism, yes, is not dead and buried with Thatcher. But on the contrary, it's been revived on the basis of events and the crisis of capitalism. And we need, yes, a leadership that's prepared to carry through to the end and a policy that is to take over the major monopolies in Britain, the banks, insurance companies, and the workers' control and management Plan the economy in the interest of working people. Then you can abolish unemployment. Then you can build houses. Then you can give people a future. But under capitalism, there is no future. You can see what happened in Greece. You can see what's happening in Portugal. That's our future in Britain. If we continue on the road of capitalism. And therefore we, yes, celebrate this event insofar as it brings a crowd together. It reaffirms our ideas about what went wrong under the last Labour government of the, of the trade unions failed to act when they should have acted. And it means we have to change those organisations, not create new ones, change them, put fighters in their place who will struggle for the working class itself. It's been done before, it can be done again, but this time there's no going back because this time the crisis is too serious and therefore we should pledge ourselves on this solemn occasion, as they say, to rededicate ourselves, yes, to an end to Toryism, true, true blue Toryism, I think that's the word they've given for this, this circus that's going to happen now, an end to that, an end to capitalism in the raw, an end to capitalism at all, and the bring about a, of a new society for us, for working people, for Christ's sake. We create the wealth, we want the wealth, not, as, not these parasites who are dominating us. In that way, we have something to look forward to, and that's the way the message, I think, from the comments on the platform, from the, the heroes who have stood up to, to Thatcherism over the last 30 years of Blairism, we rededicate ourselves to them and say we will carry on the fight to ensure that we get to that measure of, of socialism and the, the happiness, yes, I use the word, the happiness and future for young people and older life. Yeah.